with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, June 21st, 2022. My name is Emma Vigeland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Robert Kuttner of the American Prospect, co-editor, joins us to discuss the supply chain crisis and globalization in general. And later in the show, David Adler, general coordinator of the Progressive International, will be joining us to break down the exciting results in Colombia's election. Meanwhile, it's day four of the January 6th hearings. And Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger is scheduled to testify about Trump's phone call to him, the infamous phone call, asking him to, quote, find votes to flip the state for him. Look under the couch cushions. The drip, drip, drip about the Uvalde cop cover-up continues as they attempt to evade scrutiny. The Texas Tribune reported that officers waited inside the school, but outside of these classrooms for over an hour, despite 911 calls from kids and pleas from parents. Biden is admitting to the press that he's speaking to Larry Summers for economic advice. He willfully said that. God help us. The U.S. is reportedly blocking over 90% of Afghans seeking to enter the country uh, on humanitarian grounds. Despite what we've done to Afghanistan, it's unconscionable. And that was fast. Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett has announced that he will resign and will dissolve the current parliament, triggering Israel's fifth round of elections in three years. Benjamin Netanyahu is waiting in the wings. All this and more on today's program. Welcome to the show, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I am in for Sam today because I'm going on a week vacation starting tomorrow. Um, My uh, my cousin, Ashley, had a baby. We're very close and uh, she lives out in California, so I haven't really been able to see her. And that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm very excited uh, to, to go see her. Um, uh, but Sam will be with you solo until next uh, Tuesday. So I'll be back next Wednesday. Uh, and Sam will be with you for the entirety of that time. So don't worry. You'll get your fill of Sam. Um, more than you could probably even stomach as a regular person. And then I'll be back uh, to lighten the load. That, that's my job. Um, and if you guys uh, didn't see, I was on TYT with Anna Kasparian last night. Definitely check that out. It was a great episode where we do- uh, dove into a lot of different topics, including the uh, Uvalde cop cover-up, which I want to lead the show with today. So we're receiving a ton more information, or not a ton. It's more of a drip, 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 as I mentioned in headlines, um, about the complete failure of a response from the Uvalde police when it came to the massacre at Robb Elementary School. The Texas Tribune came out with a piece yesterday reporting on how the Uvalde cops were inside of the school with all of their gear, with shields, with rifles, and they were stationed outside of the classrooms where the shooter was massacring children. So the piecing together of this information, it just gets more damning by the day. There's currently testimony that's happening, so we're receiving this information in pieces. 
but uh, the AP is reporting that the Texas police commander said officers could have stopped the gunman within three minutes in Uvalde. The public safety chief, who I believe uh, will be hearing from in a second, Steve McCraw, said that the classroom door in the shooting was not locked, even though cops were waiting for a key. What's the point of having all that gear on if you can't kick down a damn door? <laughs> I probably could do it with a few people in street clothes. And these cops didn't do it with all of their gear on. But here is the uh, public safety director, Steve McCraw, testifying on what happened here. And Matt pointed out before the show that he seems a little shaky. And that's because Texas officials are not used to being in opposition to the police, but this is so egregious that... Yeah, I mean, cops don't like to criticize cops, particularly in Texas. Here he is uh, talking about, in no uncertain terms how awful the Uvalde police response was. There's compelling evidence that the law enforcement response to the attack at Robb Elementary was an abject failure and antithetical to everything we've learned over the last two decades since the Columbine massacre. Three minutes after the subject entered the West Building, there was sufficient number of armed officers wearing body armor to isolate, distract, and neutralize the subject. The only thing stopping a hallway of dedicated officers from entering room 111 and 112 was the on-scene commander, who decided to place the lives of officers before the lives of children. The officers had weapons, the children had none. The officers had body armor, the children had none. The officers had training, the subject had none. One error, 14 minutes and eight seconds. That's how long the children waited and the teachers waited in rooms 111 to be rescued. And while they waited, the on-scene commander waited for a radio and rifles. Then he waited for shields. Then he waited for SWAT. Lastly, he waited for a key that was never needed. The post Columbine doctrine is clear and compelling and unambiguous. Stop the killing, stop the dying. You can't do the former unless you do, you can't do the latter unless you do the former. Certainly, some things were done well, and even very well. The teachers quickly implemented active shooter protocols prior to the subject gaining the entry. In fact, one teacher was able to call 911 and report that before the subject entered the campus. So that point at the end there is key because, because the cops have been, with the aid of Republican politicians, frankly, trying to blame teachers for not following protocols, effectively rocks in the door, which ended up being a lie, um, uh, teachers not being uh, efficient enough in the midst of their panic and sheer terror as a shooter comes towards them unarmed, they weren't good enough at locking the doors. But in fact, actually, they followed the safety protocols pretty much to the T. Pretty much to the T, even though the fact that they have are burdened with such protocols is unconscionable in and of itself. It, were, it was the cops it was the cops that didn't follow any of their own rules. And these are rules that are written down. Like, in addition, you know, we're going to, in the fun half, uh, talk about Joe Rogan and some fascists talk about how this is because defund the police, um, uh, emasculated police. But Uvalde, 40% did not defund the police. And, in fact, 40% of that uh, city's budget goes to those cops. And they have um, in uh, extra funding and training uh, for specifically this uh, contingency and like the, the the policies were explicitly confront the attacker time is the number one enemy immediate action can dramatic uh, have dramatic impact on reducing casualties and prioritizing innocent lives over officer lives that's on the books yeah and they just don't care because cops uh, have apologists like joe rogan and all these republicans that will bend over backwards even when other cops are saying yeah they let kids die because they were afraid. They waited for a key they didn't need to go into a room that wasn't locked because they were afraid. 
And that's the reality because they're also lying to hide their cowardice. Um, Which is even, uh, I think, a <laughs> bigger emergency, honestly. Well, I mean, it's also like the, the testimony there from Public uh, Safety Director Steve McCraw, that's good. Does it change your opinion at all on the structure of policing in this country? Because it should. Cops lie all the damn time. All the time. They lie like they're breathing. They lie like fishes. <laughs> and not like you lie about, like, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm out sick to work today. Yeah, uh, they <laughs> lie over dead bodies. Yeah, and this is what they did here. The San Antonio uh, Express News reported that there was no evidence that the officers actually tried the uh, doors in rooms 111 and 112, which is what the police chief said. Uh, there was no key that was necessary. That's what we're finding out now. Um, yesterday, the uh, Austin American Statesman reported that the officers did have all the equipment that was necessary to break into the classrooms, uh, which should be obvious, but it's part of the information that's being pieced together right here. Uh, the New York Times also has um, been doing some reporting on this, but the Texas Tribune is on the case as well, and that's what's necessary here because they're trying to wait out the national news coverage. Um, there needs to be more local reporting from uh, the Tribune, but even more local than that, like the Austin American Statesman, the other, uh, the San Antonio Express News, which uh, Uvalde is, is uh, decently close to, because these are the kinds of relation, uh, this is the kind of reporting and local news reporting that will be there for the months and months that the cops try to filibuster this investigation um, into. They try to kick the can down the road so that they don't face accountability because they're used to lying and they're used to not having any accountability. But the problem here is, is that there's 19 dead children. And hopefully, hopefully, there continues to be sunlight on this and hopefully... It leads to a broader reckoning with policing in this country. Unfortunately, Democrats on the national federal level are so afraid of being called anti-cop that they have not made the connection here, which I think is so common sense. That this is why defund the police is actually pretty good, pretty good concept. Because this is indicative of larger policing problems in America. And this is the rule. It's not the exception. The way that they conduct themselves here. Yeah, I mean, I think the the just sort of philosophizing over the defund the police slogan. From my perspective, I understand people that want to like uh, India Walton says, you know, we want to emphasize that we are reinvesting and not just taking money out because, frankly, like rich liberals can see, oh, defund the police, I'll save the uh, same reason why like people like Tulsi Gabbard like to defund the military because they just want less taxes. But um, ultimately, like the there's an organizational problem that is deeper than reforms can get. We have specifically on the book saying prioritize the lives of children over your own lives. And the cops sat there not doing that. Yep. That's it. Yeah. That's a key example about reform and like the liberal proclivity for that kind of tweak being not enough. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, come back, we'll be joined by Robert Kuttner.
We are back, and we are joined now by uh, Robert Kuttner, co-founder and co-editor of The American Prospect, professor at Brandeis University, and author of Going Big, FDR's Legacy, Biden's New Deal, and the Struggle to Save Democracy. Uh, thanks so much for being here, Robert. It's a pleasure. Thanks so, for having me. Of course. So uh, your piece in The American Prospect after hyperglobalization uh, was one of the most comprehensive um, pieces on this topic that I've read. And you begin it talking about how, quote, hyperglobalization is dead. How do you define hyperglobalization and what killed it? <laughs> yes. Well, so hyperglobalization is the idea that there should be no barriers of any kind, no regulatory constraints to... Uh, commerce when commerce crosses borders. And when you think about that, that flies in the face of every advanced democracy since FDR, which regulates, which taxes, which has labor standards, which has environmental standards, which constrains capitalism in a variety of ways because capitalism tends to be both inefficient and unjust. But somehow the globalizers got hold of the microphone and they persuaded the broad public and they persuaded Democratic Party elites that somehow when commerce crosses borders, it ought to be completely impervious to any kind of regulatory constraints. So if we have labor standards at home, well, when commerce crosses borders, commerce doesn't need labor standards. And so this was a backdoor way of dismantling regulated capitalism. Now, what killed it? Um, and it's not quite dead. You know, it's a zombie. I mean, it keeps arising from the dead. But um, first of all, the rise of China uh, and the claim made by Clinton and other globalizers that if we just let China into the WTO, the World Trade Organization, and gave China all the rights of other countries, China would somehow behave more like a democratic capitalist nation. Well, China made a liar out of Bill Clinton. And China is eating America's lunch on product area after product area, technology after technology, not playing by the rules. And it fell to the Biden administration to finally appreciate what was going on. I mean, Trump got us part of the way there with the tariffs, but this was mostly jingoistic. It was anti-foreign. So Biden has a coherent understanding of why you can't assume that China is going to play by the rules. So China killed it. And then the supply chain shock killed it. Again, one of the conceits of hyperglobalization was that if you have just-in-time production and you source all kinds of products to far-flung factories, you'll save a little bit of money on the inventory that you don't have to keep in your warehouse. But you have a crisis, the whole thing falls apart. And that's what happened with COVID. So COVID killed hyperglobalization, the supply chain crisis. And then finally, the, 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 the last nail in the coffin is Russia's war against Ukraine, where uh, not only China, but another major authoritarian player in the trading system, which had been admitted as a member in good standing. Now there are all kinds of sanctions against Russia. So the question now is, uh, you know, can you put Humpty Dumpty back together again? No, you can't. You shouldn't. Uh, good riddance to hyperglobalization. But the intriguing question is, what's the next system going to look like? And who is it going to benefit? And I want to get into that. But you mentioned Clinton uh, there. And I want to just go back to give a bit of a, a retrospective on the uh, origins of globalization as we see from the 90s and on. Um, talk a little bit about the uh, about NAFTA and its origins and how the uh, move away from uh, multilateral trade agreements towards bilateral trade agreements during that time period birthed uh, this complex and frankly inefficient trade system. Well, and it's not only the move away from multilateral agreements to bilateral deals like NAFTA, it's also a shift in the kind of multilateral deals. You know, until the 90s, uh, multilateral deals were very simple. You cut your tariffs, I cut my tariffs. And nobody tried to use multilateral deals under the WTO to tell countries how to run their own economies. If you wanted to have a nationalized sector, you could have a nationalized sector. If you wanted to have an industrial policy, 
you could have an industrial policy. But once the WTO comes along, um, all of this stuff is just ideologically forbidden. And uh, unlike the, the old general agreement on tariffs and trade, the WTO actually had teeth. Uh, it could sanction countries that didn't go along with the WTO formula. So what happens in the 90s? Well, there's, there's two words you need to keep in mind. Goldman Sachs. Um, most of the uh, elements of hyperglobalization were designed by and for investment banks and by and for big multilateral corporations. And the instrument of this was Bob Rubin, who was Bill Clinton's top economic guy, came from Goldman Sachs, went back to Wall Street, went to Citigroup after he left Clinton. And so Democrats, you know, going back to Roosevelt, Democrats had a very different vision of how capitalism is supposed to operate. It's supposed to be highly regulated so that uh, workers get a fair shake. And beginning with Clinton, um, you use multilateral deals to undercut the ability of any country to regulate capitalism. And you use bilateral deals like NAFTA to give American banks a big foothold in uh, the Mexican financial system to make it easier for American uh, auto companies to outsource production to Mexico, to make it harder for Mexico to practice any kind of economic nationalism. And so the whole thing needs to be understood, not just in textbook free trade theory, but in terms of Wall Street and the biggest multinational corporations trying to make the global economic system over in their image for their benefit and Clinton becomes the instrument of this. And and so what were some of the regulations that these capitalists uh, were in particular trying to avoid? You have probably you mentioned Goldman banking, obviously labor. Uh, I think that there's uh, uh, that's an important uh, wrinkle to explore. And I would say the other one that comes to mind, environmental regulation, were those kind of the big three in terms of. Uh, what free trade allowed some of these corporations to circumvent in terms of sovereign regulations country by country? Absolutely. Banking, health, safety, environment. And um, this gets a little bit wonky, but it's very important. There, there's a nasty little device that they came up with called investor state dispute resolution. What does that mean? That means that under NAFTA and under some of the other uh, multilateral deals that they made, if a corporation thinks that a particular regulation violates its right to have cross-border commerce not interfered with, it can go to a special kangaroo court that doesn't have any of the due process that ordinary democracies have, and it can get a ruling that, for instance, um, the requirement that fishing nets be dolphin safe that violates their right to free commerce. And um, one of the really interesting things that happened under Trump, um, you recall that under Trump, the Democrats in Congress worked together with Trump to get rid of NAFTA and substitute something called the US-Canada uh, uh, agreement. And that got rid of this kangaroo court and run idea. Uh, it also made it possible to enforce uh, the right of Mexican workers to organize unions. And so you have a successor to NAFTA that interestingly is the result of congressional progressive Democrats cutting a deal with Trump that, that's actually better than NAFTA. And this was sort of one of the first steps back in the direction of a more regulated form of trade. The history is very important here, by the way. At the Bretton Woods meetings of 1944, where Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, was the chairman of the conference, the idea was that we need to take the New Deal na uh, international. We need a global counterpart of the New Deal. And that's what Bretton Woods tried to do. And so for 30 years, you had the ability, uh, despite a lot of international trade, of countries to regulate capitalism. And then trade gets used as an all-purpose battering ram to undermine that. Uh can you go back to uh, that that history then there under FDR, where um, there were some 
different visions that were proposed. I mean, the fact that Keynes was involved, I think, is uh, apt, given the fact that the uh, Democratic Party in this country very uh, methodically moved away from Keynesian economics towards this free trade nonsense that has set us up in this uh, predicament that we're in right now um, and has exacerbated global inequality and domestic inequality. But there wasn't uh, an alternate vision, the international trade organization that you write about. What was that vision and how is that different from the, uh, the WTO, which is clearly quite tilted in favor of the United States and, and right. other major uh, moneyed countries? So it's 1944. The Allies are winning the war. And the question is, what is the post-war economic system going to look like? Now, Keynes got a do-over. He first becomes famous in 1919, where he rails against the Treaty of Versailles, which uh, required Germany to pay crushing reparations that really laid the seeds for World War II and uh, Nazism. And so Keynes is determined that the global financial and economic system is going to facilitate rather than frustrate managed capitalism a la the New Deal at home. And so the idea was there would be three institutions. There would be an international monetary fund so that if a country got into balance of payments difficulties, instead of punishing it the way Greece was punished, you would advance it money and you would tide it over and help it avoid having to go into bouts of austerity to satisfy international creditors. Uh, there were fixed exchange rates so that speculators could not speculate in, in currency values. There was a, a World Bank to have public development capital so that you weren't so reliant on private investors who could set all kinds of onerous terms. And there was supposed to be, in addition to the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, uh, a third organization called the International Trade Organization, which was fascinating in that it reconciled uh, an increase in trade with the ability of countries to enforce labor rights so that if you violated labor rights, I could levy a tariff against your exports. And that was negotiated. Uh, a treaty was drafted. It was approved by dozens of countries, but it was too radical by, by then. This is 1948, 1949. Roosevelt's dead. The Republicans control Congress. The center of gravity has shifted to the right. Big business has more influence again. And so the ITO uh, treaty, International Trade Organization, never, tr never ratified. And then 40 years later, the WTO is a pure capitalist right-wing version of what Keynes had uh, tried to create as a more social democratic version. Talk a little bit about the WTO as it is currently constructed, if you could, um, and what its role is. I mean, you, you talk about the kangaroo court aspect, but if you don't mind expanding on its place uh, in, in our global supply chain. Well, last week we had just a chilling reminder of the power of the WTO in the whole controversy about whether to waive intellectual property rights so that poor countries could have affordable vaccines. And um, there's a provision of the World Trade Organization called TRIPS, which is trade and, and intellectual property, which means patents and trademarks and copyrights. And ever since the COVID outbreak happened, all of the progressive groups all over the world have been trying to get an, inter an intellectual property waiver so that um, poor countries would not have to pay these filthy rich vaccine makers sticker prices for vaccines. And uh, Biden, to his credit, came out for an intellectual property waiver. So this drags on for two years. And at the WTO last week, all of the ministers are trying to negotiate some kind of a waiver. And the European Union, which is carrying water for the big drug companies, refused to permit it. And the a Biden administration meekly goes along with a little bit of window dressing, which um, doesn't get rid of intellectual property protections and allows uh, the big vaccine makers to charge sticker prices to poor countries who can't afford sticker prices. So 
there's an example of how the WTO is used to entrench, as a matter of international law, uh, property rights in public goods. Uh, I mean, what could be more powerful as a public health emergency than the COVID pandemic? But even in the most uh, extreme emergency in, in a century, because of the power of WTO to act on behalf of the drug companies, um, we did not get an intellectual property waiver so that countries could get affordable vaccines. Now, Trump did one very astute thing. And of course, it wasn't Trump. It was Trump's uh, chief trade guy, a guy named Robert Lighthizer, who could have been a progressive Democrat. Uh, you know, there's an old saying that even a stopped clock is right twice a day. And this was Trump's only virtuous appointment. And so Lighthizer came up with the idea of having the United States not agree to any new appointees to the uh, WTO's appellate court. And so the appellate court lacks a quorum. And so the appellate court is out of business, which means that WTO rulings on various controversies about whether something violates uh, uh, some stricture against uh, um, industrial policy or what have you, they're out of business. And Biden, to his credit, is is not putting them back in business. But the WTO has so much residual power that the WTO was able to be used as a venue to block a waiver of intellectual property rights so that poor countries still are barred from getting vaccines. So it's, you know, one other interesting point here. Whenever somebody says, hey, the United States should waive sovereignty so that we can have an international criminal court, or the United States should waive sovereignty so that we can have a treaty on landmines. The United States says, oh no, we can't do that. We can't waive sovereignty. But the United States is perfectly happy to waive sovereignty when the effect is to give multinational corporations rights to sue the United States to block right. uh, regulations that constrain capitalism. And that is a, a key point, obviously. I mean, I uh, the fact that the, the WTO and uh, the hyper global globalized system that we've set up is has different sets of rules for different countries. So uh, the United States, obviously a major player, but countries like Saudi Arabia that uh, have oil wealth also clearly uh, behave by different sets of rules. And the global South is affected by this. So can you talk a little bit about how sovereignty is respected for uh, some nations, especially if they're going to be hyper capitalist um, and nations that are, are the subject of extraction, it's a it's def definitely a different set of rules. Absolutely. So, for instance, um, one of the things that is really harming the global south is that the drug companies and other big companies are trying to turn um, time honored natural uh, ingredients into patented products so that you can uh, turn them into commercial articles, uh, uh, things that native peoples have used as traditional medicines uh, for eons. Now, now these are going to be patented, and you have to buy them at market prices. Uh, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, the United States had all kinds of industrial policies. And um, Britain and the United States regular sto regularly stole each other's ideas so that both countries could industrialize. But now that we are the, the, the big kids on the block, we say to uh, the poor countries, oh, well, sorry, you can't do that. You can't have an industrial policy because that would be protectionist. So there's a, there's a complete double standard here. And uh, one of the few times that this has been waived was uh, thanks to George W. Bush, of all people, who developed some conscience about the AIDS pandemic. And Bush sided with the global South and really forced the um, big drug companies to allow uh, uh, AIDS medications to be uh, used under, under mandatory licensing so that there could be cheap production in the third world. And that shows what's possible, but it's a complete one-off. It's the exception that proves the rule. The United States has the power to side with the global South, it just almost never does. And the only great exception was in the case of, of AIDS medicines. 
but that's to be understood is the self-interest of multinational corporations. And Obama got captured by this. Uh, Clinton got captured by this. And of course, they're all richly rewarded. They're not just captured. All, all these guys go back to work for Wall Street and they make seven figures and even eight figure uh, national income, na- you know, incomes. Um, so what happens when when Trump gets elected, um, Trump is in bed with the big corporations and the big banks, but he realizes that economic nationalism has a certain appeal. He realizes that uh, xenophobia has a certain appeal. So he decides maybe he's going to be in bed with Putin, but he's going to be anti-China. And China becomes the nemesis. And so one of the things, and again, this is Robert Lighthizer, who's a very important guy here, who really understands this. Trump only understands the rhetoric, but Lighthizer really understands how the, uh, the international economic system works. And so, you know, trade law is so convoluted that if you try to prove that China is subsidizing its products uh, and stealing intellectual property, and you do this one case at a time, it, it's like whack-a-mole. You, you just get hung up in court forever. And so what Lighthizer did was he said, okay, I'm just going to cut the knot. I'm going to assume that the approximate cost of all of China's illegal subsidy and dumping is about 25%, which in fact is ballpark accurate. And so we're just going to levy across the board tariffs on Chinese exports to the tune of 25%. And, um, you know, this just came as a complete shock to the entire trade establishment. And as Lori Wallach uh, likes to say, hey, the earth didn't fall off its axis. Life went on. And uh, wow, we could actually do this. And this gave American industry a bit of a respite. Uh, It allowed American steel to begin to recoup. It allowed American solar producers to begin to recoup. And there's not much China can do about it. And so to his credit, Biden has kept the tariffs, even though there's been a huge amount of lobbying to try and get him to rescind the tariffs. And he is trying to build a rather more subtle, more complicated version of an industrial policy than than Trump ever did, so that we could try to actually reshore, reclaim uh, some of this industrial technology. And the problem is tech is kind of on the other side, right? Because tech makes a lot of money getting into bed with the Chinese and Wall Street's on the other side because Wall Street makes a lot of money getting into into bed with the other side. So, you know, China doesn't have this problem, right? It's a dictatorship. It speaks with one voice or you go to prison. But China has all of these uh, American stooges that act in the interest of China so that the United States doesn't speak with one voice. Well, I mean, isn't China just kind of the fact that they're playing by their own rules? That seems to be uh, stealing from the playbook of the United States to a degree. Yeah, it is. But here's the tricky question. China absolutely has a right to... uh, develop its own economy any way it wants to. And if it wants to develop its own economy with a lot of subsidy, a lot of state capital, you know, God bless it, because China has increased living standards. But it's also a dictatorship. And here's where the problem comes. It, it isn't just, you know, uh, the, 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 the genocide of the Uyghurs and the fact that um, you can't dissent. And leave that aside for a minute. But what happens when you are operating in a third country and you have a Chinese product, let's let's say solar cells, that are produced with state capital and slave labor and um, government subsidies trying to compete with an American product that more or less plays by the rules of ordinary capitalism? Well, guess who wins? The Chinese producer crowds out the American producer. So... Yes, China can absolutely play by whatever rules it wants to. It's a sovereign country when it's developing its own economy. But you get into a clash in the rest of the world where American producers are trying to compete with Chinese producers. And I would like to think that eventually there will have to be some kind of mutual understanding that gives each country the right to play by its own rules and then figure out what kinds of tariffs or what kinds of adjustments are the appropriate way 
to have something that's approximating a level playing field when you're looking at exports in other countries. Are there rules in capitalism? Oh, yeah. There are rules in capitalism. And the fundamental rule of capitalism is property. Is property. But in terms of uh, standards and, and how one treats one's laborers, I mean, there are, uh, without regulation, and look, uh, this is more of an existential question, but is it possible um, that, you know, cutting cutting standards and not playing by the rules is inherent to just ch achieving ultimate uh, profit margins, and that's kind of the name of the game, is it not? Sure. The, 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 the only rule in capitalism is property. And um, uh, once I have a right to property, I'm going to be as cutthroat as I possibly can as an entrepreneur to make as much money as I can. And I'm going to screw labor as much as I can. And the only reason labor has any rights at all is that labor got organized and organized unions. And occasionally labor had an ally in the White House like Franklin Roosevelt. And so you have the Wagner Act and, and you have something of a foothold, which, of course, has gotten weaker and weaker over time. And after Truman, a Democratic presidents really stopped defending labor unions very much. And again, it's only Biden who has begun to defend labor unions again. So the only reason that that capitalism in some countries is semi civilized is because all of the struggles that have gone on. So. What what's next? What is the next trade vision? I mean, are we talking about uh, in order to s curb the exploitation of the global south um, and also in order to create redundancy in our supply chains? Because we're seeing right now that the major problems of having all of uh, these different complicated paths in order to deliver goods, it's not sustainable, especially when COVID comes around. Um, is that more about creating smaller regional trade uh, trade relationships where it is less um, dependent on a massively complex and easily uh, disrupted global supply chain? Yeah. I, so I think the first thing that's likely to happen and that should happen is that um, – the, the premise of multilateralism where everybody supposedly plays by the same rules is dead because everybody doesn't play by the same rules and we should stop pretending that they do. So that's thing one. Thing two, the United States has to reclaim some of its own production, its supply chains. It's, it has to engage in serious reshoring. Biden has begun to do some of that, although not enough. And the third thing that has to happen is there has to be a new deal for the global south where some of these constraints against uh, allowing the global south to develop, uh, the fact that the bond market has so much so much power. I'm sorry, my dog's barking. Okay. Um, the fact that the bond market has so much power that, you know, if, if, if an ordinary corporation declares bankruptcy, it gets to wipe out its debts. But if you're Argentina, you don't get to do that because the American uh, investment banking companies wrote the rules. And so Argentina never <laughs> gets to write off its debt. And so you need a new deal for the global south where you waive a lot of these intellectual property rights that are another form of property that could be constrained. And you change the terms of uh, credit so that if somebody extends credit to a third world country that is corrupt and that country goes bankrupt, the people of the country and their children and grandchildren whose fault the corruption is not don't get stuck with paying off the bills. So I think all three things need to happen. A new deal for the global South, a, a reshoring of production in the United States, some kind of modus vivendi with China, and a dropping of the pretense that everybody plays, plays by the same rules. Robert Kuttner, uh, co-founder, co-editor of The American Prospect, author of Going Big, FDR's Legacy, Biden's New Deal, and the Struggle to Save Democracy. Uh, you can read his piece on this topic called After Hyperglobalization, which was in the June issue of The American Prospect magazine. Uh, Robert, thanks so much for your time today. I mean, that was a great conversation. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, folks, we are going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we are going to be joined by David Adler to discuss the results of the Colombian election.
We are back yeah. and we are joined now by David Adler, General Coordinator of the Progressive International, here to talk about the results of the Colombian election. David, thanks so much for your time today, Then Thanks for coming on. My first time on the show, Emma. Thanks so much for having me. <gasps> that is very exciting. Well, we're really happy to have you. Um, I'm happy we could make it work because these were some really positive re uh, election results coming out of Colombia. Uh, the first leftist president elected and an amazing story in terms of the vice presidential uh, candidate that was also elected alongside Petro. So uh, talk about those results and, and how encouraging and exciting it is. Yeah, they're amazing results and they're surprising results in so many different ways. I can think of at least three ways. One way is reaching into the longer history of Colombia, uh, one of the only countries in the whole hemisphere, I'm going to exclude our own United States for a little while here, that has never had a leftist leader or progressive government. This is the crown jewel of U.S. empire, our great needle into the old pink tide and the basically key to the maintenance of the Monroe Doctrine for so long. So to have a progressive government come to power, to be allowed to come to power, I should say, uh, is so amazing in a country famous for assassinating left-wing leaders and anyone who approaches the presidency from the left side of the political spectrum. So it's amazing in that way. It's amazing, as you mentioned, because of the composition of a ticket, in particular, the VP candidate, Francia Marquez, an Afro-Colombian feminist and socialist and land defender who rose to fame despite being from a very poor and marginalized community in Colombia, precisely for leading nationwide movements in defense of planet and people. So for her to be so close, uh, to power, I shouldn't say so close to power, for her to be taking power, assuming the vice presidency is truly historic. And it's huge because it did not look necessarily like we were going to win this election, that the ticket was going to be able to win based on the results in the first round. There had been so much work that had been done before the first round to build what is known as the Pacto Historico, that is the great coalition of left, progressive, communist, liberal, trot, and even opportunist conservative forces that came together behind the ticket of Petro and Francia, that when we got to 40%, which was our first round vote before the runoff, many of us thought, well, how are we going to get past this? And the answer was hard campaigning and doing what's been so difficult for progressives to do in the United States, actually call on some of the most marginalized communities in the country who rarely turn out to vote, to turn out at unprecedented levels, to have their voice heard and bring this incredible historic ticket to power. So. Uh Talk a little bit about that coalition and if you could span, expand on it a bit more, because uh, Francia Marquez, I mean, th it seems like she was instrumental to the success of the ticket, given the uh, coalition of indigenous voters, of black uh, Colombian uh, voters. And it was along the margins of the nation, which is very different in terms of the coalition that has previously brought uh, presidents and vice presidents to power. So how different was that in terms of turnout of those particular groups and how that how did that make a difference? Yeah, for the last 20 years, Colombia has been dominated by a political tradition called Uribismo, uh, na so named because of the president Alvaro Uribe, who not only came to power with this whopping majority, the only president in recent history to be elected in the first round before a runoff due to his high level of popularity, but also because he kind of grandfathered in his successors, most recently Ivan Duque, who is the kind of inheritor of Uribismo and, and, and maintainer of the political tradition. And they were talking about a deep heartland that is uh, composed not of those much more marginalized communities, exactly like you mentioned, the Afro-Colombian community, the indigenous community, the Amazonian community, but uh, a wealthier, more conservative political tradition whose priorities were uh, basically inflating wealth on wealth inequality under the banner of economic growth and a massive law and order and justice program, which is <laughs> primarily about uh, teaming up with the United States to funnel huge amounts of weaponry under what was known as Plan Colombia, that was Uribe's alliance with George W. Bush and with successive presidents as well, to arm death squads, paramilitaries, in the you know under the banner of uh, eradicating the FARC, eradicating um, these left-wing guerrilla military groups, um, uh, and instead kind of arming whoever would take the guns to hunt them down. Um, and so from 2016, when they signed a peace accord, it was a very famous moment in Colombian history. It was that led to the dissolution of the FARC, who had been in the countryside for a long time, 
sustaining a kind of civil war uh, in Colombia. But the violence never really stopped there. The violence just kept going, and in the vacuum left by the FARC's departure, in fact, those paramilitaries moved in with even greater force, even greater violence. And the massacres and the death squads, these things continued to rampage and ravage the countryside, targeting and assassinating Black, Indigenous, popular leaders. Uh, it was a huge crisis that led to an uprising in 2019 in Colombia. I say all of this because it was precisely those targeted communities, the victims of a failed and sustained, a failed peace process and sustained campaign of violence against anyone who dared raise their voice against Uribismo. It's those communities to which this vict victory belongs because they were the ones who turned out in such historic numbers and such historic levels. They were the ones who agreed to make this pact with more establishment parties in the Pacto Historico to say, this is our chance. This is our opportunity. We have to seize it and build a kind of coalition from the very, very base, from the very, very grassroots up to the presidency. And you mentioned that uprising in 2019. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how that set the stage uh, for this victory? Because uh, Duque, the, the president at the time, presided over this massive national strike uh, in Colombia and attacked protesters aggressively with cops, which the... the it's amazing how organizations responded in terms of uh, getting uh, these these groups to to coalesce and and it paying off electorally. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was I'm smiling only because uh, to no one's surprise, David Frum has a new piece in the Atlantic. I was going to bring that up uh, shortly with you, but yeah, no, yeah, let's, let's wait to get to what uh, the great David Frum is saying in the pages of the Atlantic. Uh, I made a joke about. Petro's victory and you're hearing the sound of a thousand Windows desktops firing up across the Atlantic Sea. <laughs> you can hear David Frum's, you know, uh, salivary glands uh, ticking along. No, but 2019 is really the critical juncture to understand what became possible in 2022. This was a moment when uh, a simple austerian reform, uh, which was about aligning Colombia's domestic fiscal austerity with its international creditor obligations, everything in Colombia involves international dimension at the end of the day, kicked off an incredible popular mobilization led by the People's Congress, led by indigenous peasant movements, popular movements, trade unions across the country who just stood up and said, we're going to hit the streets down to this government, down, down, down to this government. And Ivan Duque unleashed a wave of violence against them and tacitly, if not explicitly, endorsed the targeted target assassination. We're talking about, I think, over 55 this year. So this is you know several years later, but in 2022, 55 target assassinations of social movement leaders across the country. I mean, the paramilitaries are still running rampant across the country. So I think there's a tendency for US Americans to look south and think democracy there, democracy here. So it's kind of a similar political environment, but I think it's difficult to overstate how historic this victory is in terms of overcoming, not necessarily just like the grip of the corporate media, but we're talking about a place where as recently as a month ago, right-wing paramilitaries were leading an armed strike, shutting down the streets in something like 12 regions of the country, trying to intimidate people from showing up to the ballot box, trying to tell them to be, you know, to make very clear, you are not welcome to vote this progressive government into power because we are the bosses around here. So 2019 gave a lot of confidence to these social movements, to these popular forces who were mobilizing against the government. And this is really their victory for that reason, because they opened the door towards a much broader, as you mentioned, largely peripheral coalition, um, most some of the most repressed, targeted, and violent places in the country to say, we've had enough. Let's pull up this David Frum piece, uh, because we, I couldn't wait any longer. Um, so Frum in The Atlantic uh, wrote this very uh, sorrowful uh, piece, if we could share this here, yeah. entitled The President Who Did Everything Right and Got No Thanks. Um, so according to Fromm, he's a moderate and um, that cracking down on protesters with targeted assassinations is doing everything right. I mean, I, I skimmed some of the piece he mentions just basically it seems like he had some sort of personal relationship with Duque uh, and had been uh, interviewing him personally. So that's what informs this kind of garbage. But David Frum, noted moderate, right, who can identify other moderates in uh, in politics. What's your response to that that garbage? 
I mean, the guy loves to apologize for violent right-wing politicians. So let's put aside the. I think what's more interest, what's less interesting about the From article is not that he wrote it because that's fairly unsurprising. What is more interesting is the active courtship of an Ivan Duque of an article like that. I mean, you mentioned Emma that there's some element of a personal relationship between them. That's not a surprise. This is, gets us to the core of the us Colombia relationship. And here's a little factoid that maybe your listeners and watch and viewers don't know that on June 2nd, this is just days after the first round of presidential voting, when there was a real risk that Petro might actually win in the first round. What did Ivan Duque do? He planned a giant celebration in Washington, D.C., where he brought him and all of his mates to D.C. to celebrate 200 years of friendship between these two countries. What happened the week before that election? The White House uh, public, uh, came to an agreement with the government of Colombia, with the Duque government, for deepening military cooperation uh, through Southcom, I think, with the, with the Colombian armed, armed forces. Uh, and that coincided with six days before the presidential election, Joe Biden announcing uh, major non-NATO ally status for Colombia. So you can see the ways in which those ties are not accidental and in many ways are not even really so ideological. They're about a profound military and imperial cooperation between two countries that Duque was doing everything in his power to sustain in a post-presidential period uh, over and above whatever democratic mandate was handed down to a president like Gustavo Petro to say, well, actually, you have to respect these agreements that we've already developed with the Biden administration, uh, with the U.S. military. Uh, and David Frum, I think, is just a kind of farting byproduct <laughs> of a much more substantial and sustained relationship between the Colombian government, armed forces and you know our own in D.C. And it's interesting, too, because the uh, right wing opposition in this election, uh, Rodolfo Hernandez, was kind of painted as a right wing populist. But uh, he was he's a real estate tycoon, but um, definitely did not, uh, from my understanding, brand himself in the same way uh, that Duque uh, branded himself as. And yet Hernandez was caught on video on a yacht paid for by Pfizer in Miami. So like, was that such a toxic image because it illustrated some sort of relationship with the United States in this current political moment and to moneyed interest there that it had some sort of sway? Or is that just my Americanized uh, reading of it from, from here? Well, I mean, it cuts both ways across different constituencies. There was a, you know, a big point that was made early on that the comparisons to Trump which many progressives, especially in the United States, thought would do damage to Hernandez, that actually just a lot of Colombians just want to live in the United States. So they were like, oh, they had Trump over there. We can have our own Trump. But certainly for another section of the Colombian population, that particular image of Rodolfo kind of partying in Miami and not taking seriously, uh, not looking presidential, not engaging with the people because he had refused to do debates, interviews, basically try to communicate exclusively through his TikTok. I think that was a big factor in his eventual loss. But as much as I'm loath to make these Trump of the tropics, you know, Creole Trump type of comparisons, because I do think that they reek of a kind of projection of US American political tradition, this, the similarities were really striking. In particular, similarities that attend to a right populist candidate that claims to crusade against an establishment while effectively being an empty vessel for those existing interests and political traditions to fill with their own interests, their own ideas. You know, this was a guy who, were he to come to power uh, as this singular crusading political force, would do much as Trump did, look around and say, all right, well, who's going to staff my ministries? You know, who's going to, of course, I'm going to go to the same set of people, uh, the same Uribistas who are hanging around, who are going to claim we have experience in government, and who are going to ultimately be the true motors, engines of what would have been a Rodolfo presidency. So the daylight that, I mean, this, this put Rodolfo in a kind of double bind, right, because so much of his vote came from, if not an anti-Uribista, a kind of Uribismo exhausted political constituency that said, we've had enough, we want an outsider candidate. So he had to keep some distance from them. But at the end of the day, he needed all those votes to basically get over the line. He needed to be with them. And I think it was that tension between, okay, we're apart, but we're the same, that ultimately did a lot of damage. Whereas to finish the comparison in the United States, Trump basically could bank on every Republican vote plus some of the more people, the people he was able to bring in as a populist. So it was a kind of Republican party plus um, 
coalition that he was able to marshal. And that didn't come together really at the end of the day with Rodolfo, where a lot of the wealthier, more conservative people kind of didn't turn out to vote because they thought, well, this guy's a fraud and he's embarrassing and he's not presidential enough. And maybe, maybe we can exist with a little bit of social democracy in our country. I wanted to play this clip for you um, because it, it well, I, I was I'm honestly hoping for your for your reaction on it. Here is Ron DeSantis talking about the uh, Colombian election results. And you talk about how uh, inextricable the relationship is between the United States and how uh, the U.S. has funded death squads and uh, just uh, brute brutality in Colombia in order to tamp down leftist uh, uprisings for decades and decades and how that is just so... Um, so interlinked uh, in uh, Colombian politics that, you know, that's the only way that you can understand it in its fullest context. And here is Ron DeSantis responding to the election results. This guy could very well be the next president of the United States, unfortunately. Here he is referring to uh, the, the, vice, uh, the, the president-elect Petro uh, as a Marxist in a derogatory way, obviously, from DeSantis. And I just want to say for on, on behalf of, of the people of Florida, we watched the election results down in Columbia, and we have a lot of great Colombian Americans here in our state who were very concerned uh, about what was going on. And I think the results of that election were, have been very, very troubling uh, for people that believe in freedom in the Western Hemisphere uh, to elect a, a former narco terrorist and a Marxist. Uh, to, to lead Colombia is going to be disastrous. And so we've stood with the people uh, here in Florida that have ties to Colombia. We've had a great relationship with Colombia as a state. Uh, we were all hoping that the outcome would be different. Uh, but we've got a problem in the Western Hemisphere uh, with Marxism and totalitarianism uh, really spreading. I mean, we thought, you know, 25 years ago, the Cold War and all this stuff, and it just keeps rearing its head. Uh, so uh, we'll continue to stand uh, with the people uh, of Florida here who are passionate about freedom in the Western Hemisphere, particularly in Colombia, uh, but, but very, very disappointing and very, very troubling. So who is he speaking to there? I mean, is he really just speaking to uh, Cuban-American exiles who are... Uh, up in arms probably about any kind of uh, wisp of leftism in Latin America? Um, or is he actually speaking to, uh, or, or is there a, a constituency of, of Colombian exiles or Colombian Americans in, um, in Florida that kind of have similar politics in that way? Oh, yeah. No, Miami is a singular cancer on the politics of the hemisphere. And I think that one of the most progressive things we can do is call for the immediate secession of Florida from the United States <laughs> so we can save our republic from the slide towards a deeply reactionary and terrifying anti-communism. I mean, just to bust a couple myths there, the narco-terrorist thing, I have no idea what he's referring to. So many people have referred to the former guerrilla thing. Okay, Gustavo Petro was part of a urban guerrilla group called the M19 that was left in, in nature, but not narco-terrorists. They were, you know, fighting against uh, the forces of reaction and dictatorship in Colombia to achieve what they ultimately achieved, which was the 1991 constitution that tried to enshrine some of the most basic democratic rights for the people of Colombia. And what did they do at that point? They disbanded and became a political party. And that's where Petro's political career really starts. So you're talking about a trajectory of political action that is... Um, shall we say, responsible, if not understandable. I mean, this guy was, you know, mayor of Bogota, where he delivered on some really critical reforms for the people of the city. He's a statesman above all else. So the idea that there's something obscenely radical or uh, narco-terroristic about Petro is not only absurd, but it's almost um, Rovian in its inversion of the truth because the true narco-terrorists are the Uribistas. Mm. Why? Because they claimed to be clamping down on a drug trade and leading the war on drugs at the instruction of the United States government when actually what they were doing is overseeing the largest acceleration of cocaine production in the countryside in huge part because of the right-wing paramilitaries that they were funding who were absolutely double-dealing the Uribistas uh, and inflicting huge amounts of violence uh, and, de and, and bloodshed 
in the countryside. So, you know, there, there is no way in which, uh, that's a classic kind of inversion to say, you know, your strength is your weakness there. When in fact, when we're talking about who expropriated property, when we're talking about who led the terroristic campaigns in Colombia, you're talking about the Colombian right wing, not its social democratic left wing that is now represented by Gustavo Petro. And, and, uh, those forces are still very much uh, prevalent in Colombia. So the struggle here is not over. I mean, the fact that the uh, the attorney general, uh, other uh, elected officials or other officials in Colombia are still in the pocket of some of these uh, moneyed uh, interests and gangs, illegal activity there, um, you know, the, the, the shadows of that still remain. So can you talk a little bit about the uphill battle that despite this being a an incredible victory that Petro um, faces and uh, uh, Francia Marquez, their administration will face in terms of the the still remaining infrastructure of U.S. influence and corruption that uh, you know DeSantis is inverting there. You know, Emma, we're seven days out at the time of recording this interview from the anniversary of the coup in Honduras, a very traumatizing moment. Uh, and one where we just only recently saw the recovery of democracy by uh, Partido Libre and the president, Xiomara Castro, after so many years of military repression that was ultimately in, you know, inflamed by, by Southcom, but then endorsed by, by Hillary Clinton when she was at the Department of State. Um, and obviously more recently than that, we saw Trump's orchestrated coup in, in Venezuela or coup attempt, I should say, with, with Juan Guaido. And then even more recently than that, uh, under in the Joe Biden presidency, we saw this heavily orchestrated and, dare I say, heavily funded, um, again, kind of grass-topped uh, or astroturfed, rather, um, coup attempt in Cuba. So, you know, when you talk about the possibility of DeSantis moving towards the presidency, it's obviously a terrifying possibility. And I'm not a, the kind of person on the left who likes to speak in conspiracy theories and talk about the CIA as a kind of omnipotent force operating in the hemisphere or around the world. But I just think that these are real questions that hang over Colombia. This is a country where political assassination is very real. Petro uh, suffered an assassination attempt in 2018, Marquez in 2019. Death threats were constantly pouring their way from the Black Eagles and other paramilitary groups throughout the campaign. None of that changes now. So the question is, uh, who's allowed to live and who ha is, you know, forced to die on the on the on the Great Cross of Uribismo remains to be seen. And that's just speaking about the international kind of military and paramilitary dimension of this. Then there's a whole question about politically. They come into this, you know, not with a huge majority in Congress, with a lot of opposition from the establishment. You're talking about a country where most of the investors signed something about two years ago called the Petro Clause that swore at the time that they would leave the country if Petro ever came to power, basically forcing him to promise not to expropriate their property, even though that was never really on the table. So there is just a whole diverse set of challenges and obstacles that stand in the way of even moderate social democratic reform in Colombia, which is why I always try to tamper, temper rather the expectations of uh, people I speak with on programs like this about what the new pink tide might actually be and look like and achieve. Because whether we're talking about Chile or we're talking about Colombia, or soon we talk about Brazil, you're talking about left or progressive governments coming to power in the context of legislative minorities that make it very difficult for them to do the type of radical sweeping and transformative change that they're promising on the campaign trail. And the risk, of course, is that leads to dissolution, dissing on Twitter, whatever it may be. But the point is, is that we have to really grapple with those obstacles and challenges and basic arithmetic of the politics in order to arrive at a fair assessment of what is to be expected from these governments. What, what role broadly has the drug war uh, from the United States played into uh, this dynamic and our relationship with Colombia uh, here? And, and what does that look like uh, going forward in, under a Petro administration? You know, Petro's primary commitment is to what he calls a politics of life, which has two different components. Component number one is a politics of life focused on uh, the drug war. I mean, focused on civic civil war and the peace process that was abandoned by Ivan Duque after the peace accords were signed in 2016. So that's bringing people to the table. And we already saw that the ELN, I think this has been verified now that the ELN, one of the major paramilitary groups that's still operating the countryside, uh, given Petro's win, is now prepared to come back to the table and reinitiate peace talks. So that's a very positive sign if it can be verified. Um, but I know Petro retweeted it. So I think that sends for a degree of verification. So one of the things is the politics of life, taking seriously these massacres and targeted killings 
that prevailed across the country for so many years. The other part of the politics of life is about uh, the ecological transition uh, and taking seriously Colombia's desire to have a sustainable and productive economy that isn't through extraction, like through fracking, isn't through extraction, even through the cocaine trade, right? Trying to replace coca plants with, for example, marijuana plants that can be legalized and exported, making them a safer, more sustainable, and more productive countryside. Uh, and it's about phasing out fossil fuels over the next decade so that, you know, Colombia can have a different set of, of resources. So, I mean, I think that when it comes to the drug trade, there is still so many paramilitary groups operating in the countryside who have tons of guns and weapons. And so questions remain about what it's going to take to bring them to the table, to disband those groups, to, to find them and target them and, and understand them and what they're doing. Um, and the irony is, Emma, that the people who know, really know about this stuff, the people who really know about who's out there, uh, who has the guns, how they're operating, how much cocaine they're producing, is the U.S. government. I mean, the U.S., when we were in Colombia, this was the message we got over and over again. You want to end this drug war, talk to your governments, because they're the only ones, even more than the Colombians, the U.S. government is the only ones who knows how much they're producing, where they're selling it, how they're getting into the United States, and how they're getting the guns to maintain their territory out in the countryside. Two more questions. I apologize. I'm going way over uh, with you if you have the time. Do you? Sure. Let's go for it. Okay, great. My first question, or first of the last two, is, um, you know, the platform also included, uh, Petro's uh, platform also included normalizing relations with Venezuela. Um, what kind of threat does that pose in the United States' estimation? Um, and, like, what, what are some of the obstacles for uh Colombia to develop a better relationship with Venezuela, uh, because that's basically kind of thumbing your nose uh, at the the U.S. Uh, international political establishment, and and you know I'm I'm all for that. Yeah, above all, di reestablishing diplomatic relations with Venezuela was the hard, was the bright red line for the Uribistas. This was a thing that could not be done. Uh, and it is it is to this day rather poisonous, not only, not least because of the kind of uh, arrival of so many migrants, so many refugees from Venezuela, that to be tarred as a Maduro supporter, let alone as a Maduro impersonator, uh, is so toxic uh, in in Colombia. And so Petro has created a lot of distance from uh, from Maduro in terms of political style and program and rhetoric. That said, it was common to both the Rodolfo Hernandez program, the other opposite candidate who was running in this election, and Gustavo Petro to reestablish diplomatic relations with Venezuela. I mean, it's not working, this system, right? I mean, it could be same, same of the United States, right? The system of isolation, sanctioning, suffering. This is not producing the, the great democratic effects, nor is it helping the people that it's designed to serve in the first place. So the obstacle is less, you know, can they reestablish diplomatic relations with Venezuela? They can do so at the drop of the hat. It's how much can they build a broader Latin American bloc that is prepared to stand with them behind the decision. And that's where Lula's victory becomes basically essential mm. because Lula is one of the only figures in the whole hemisphere who's been able to maintain such good relations with all parties, who's never been disloyal really to the Cubans and Venezuelans, but who's also been able to maintain, partly because Brazil is such a giant country with a huge economy, 220 million people, it's a really big country. It has that heft geopolitically to able to kind of move its weight around and try to hold together an integrated continental project. So while there is a lot of sensitivity for all in Colombian politics in general to any proximity to the Bolivarian revolution in Venezuela, I'm still hopeful that the broader turn towards a, these pink tie governments is going to facilitate a reestablishment of diplomatic relations. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. This is last one, one B. What is AMLO's uh, response in Mexico in terms of, I mean, the, is, is, are, are they basically precluded from, um, from a, any kind of uh, d touching the third rail of Venezuela or even um, Colombian leftist politics in this way broadly because of our trade relations and economic relations with the U.S.? That remains to be seen. Uh, it's not clear to because the U.S. Venezuelan relationship is also in flux, uh, and the U.S. also hasn't decided whether it wants to like ease up the sanctions and get closer to this country as a way of kind of 
playing its role in the new Cold War with China, or whether it is so scared of a new, you know, red wave that it's going to keep its uh, boot on the neck of Venezuela. It's not really clear what's going to happen. So we're going to have to play it as it lays and see how the U.S. responds. And I think in that conversation, it's really critical to emphasize that the U.S. state is huge, that there are so many different pieces that move relatively autonomously. When we talk about Southcom, the U.S. Southern Command, that is different than when we're talking about the National Security Council. You know, there are just a lot of different, our deep state, our sort of subterranean state is just extensive. Uh, and so it's not clear that we can read uh, very well what's happening in the minds of all these different people across military intelligence and the Biden administration. With AMLO, I mean, I don't know, AMLO's thrilled. I mean, he's yeah. AMLO very committed to this project of Latin American integration, if only at the kind of political and diplomatic level. He, he spent this morning at his Mañanera, which is his early press conference, kind of suggesting that they, you know, have a great cumbia and inviting Petro and has been very supportive. In fact, so supportive that the Colombians put a uh, foreign, foreign office, foreign ministry, put out a big press release accusing AMLO of foreign intervention for saying, I hope Petro wins. So I think that there's a lot of room there uh, to kind of build ties between those countries. And AMLO, like Lula, because Mexico is a very big country, has been able to kind of move his weight around in defense, in particular the Cubans, uh, but also, you know, later on, uh, helping Evo escape the coup in 2019, these kinds of things. So there is more fertile ground. I mean, I can't explain just how much room Petro's victory makes for a new kind of hemispheric politics, but I remain very hopeful. Okay, so I will end on this. Francia Marquez, um, we haven't talked about her that much, uh, the new vice president or incoming vice president in Colombia. Um, the lo longtime environmental activist, former housekeeper, lawyer, um, basically has been doing the work for a long period of time and will be the first uh, black vice president in Colombian history. I mean, w talk about the historic nature of, of her ascendancy to the vice presidency. Everything you said, Emma, I mean, you know, her CV, not only in terms of where she came from, but how much she's accomplished in terms of leading a nationwide, and you might even say through inspiring so many other land defenders across the continent, a continental uh, movement against transnational corporations, logging, mining, all these industries that prey on marginalized communities uh, and destroy their land. She's been such an inspiring figure for so long. And that's why I think she was able to marshal so much hope and turn out so many people to vote in this historic election for whom her candidacy alone represented such a leap forward for the politics of Colombia that, you know, they're just thrilled and turning out to party for the past two days, given her victory on Sunday night. David Adler, uh, General Coordinator of the Progressive International. Uh, thank you so much for, for taking the time to speak with us uh, today about the results in Colombia. It was a pleasure. A great debut. Thank you, Emma. Of course. Well, well we, we have to have you back, and we will. All right. That said, folks, we are now going to head into the fun half of the program. Um, figured I need to go long on that, though. Because... Jumbo show today. Yes. Certainly. Um, all right, Matt, what is happening in the Matt Leckian media universe? Uh, yeah, uh, last night I was on Give Them an Argument, so people might want to go check out um, me. We talked about Tulsi Gabbard, uh, Tim Poole, and James <laughs> O'Keefe, the uh, people that <clears throat> Ben is going to be uh, debating about, um, you know, uh, media misinformation, stuff like that, which is interesting. Um, so, yeah, we... we uh, we cut it up about uh, those folks, so check that out. Uh, give them argument uh, YouTube page. All right, with that, we I don't we'll see how many calls we get to. Um, I'm sorry, guys, if you've been IM IMing, the IMs are are broken. I, I don't know what's going on today. Oh no, I, oh. I haven't gotten any. Have well. you been seeing this, Bradley? Have you seen any? I, I uh, All right, no, no, I just mean like. If anyone, if you guys have been seeing them, I haven't, it, maybe it's just my computer, but I don't think so. Yeah, I'm not seeing them either. Um, we're going to try to take some calls, uh, and maybe if the IMs start to work again, we'll be reading some IMs. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now, and I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now, but I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow.
What? What is that going on? It's nuts! Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. The majority report. Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. Fun. Matt. Who? Fun. What is up, everyone? Fun. No, me key. You did it. Fun. Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint everyone. I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women Stop talking oh, for wow. a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But, dude, uh, you want to smoke this? Uh, seven, eight? Yes. Hi, me? This me? Yes. Uh, is this me? Is it me? It is you. Is this me? Hello, is this me? I think it is you. Who is you? Oh, no sound. Every single freaking day. What's on your mind? Sports. We can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism. Oh, I'm gonna go for that. Who libertarians? They're so stupid though. Common sense says, of course. Gobbledygook. We fucking did. So, what's 79 plus 21? Challenge met. I'm positively quivering. I believe 96, I want to say. 857 210 35501 one half. 38? 911, for instance. $3,400. $1,900. Five, four, three trillion dollars sold. It's a zero sum game. Actually, you're making me think less. Of but, but let me say this. Poop. <laughs> you call it satire. Sam goes, it's satire. On top of it all? Yeah. My favorite part about yeah. you is just like every day, all day, like yeah. everything you do. Without a doubt. Hey, buddy, we see you. <laughs> all right, folks, folks, folks. It's just the week being weeded out, obviously. Yeah, sun's out, guns out. I, I, I don't know. But you should know. People the, the, just don't like to entertain ideas anymore. I have a question. Who cares? Um, Our chat is enabled, wow. folks. I love it. I do love that. Uh, uh, this, Look, um, gotta jump. You gotta be quick. I gotta jump. I'm losing it, bro. Uh, um, Two o'clock. We're already late, and the guy's being a dick. So screw him. Um, um, sent to a gulag. Outrageous. Like, what is wrong yeah. with you? Love you, bye. Love you. Bye-bye.